Okay, today we're going to talk about genre analysis, which is pretty foundational in the course and also known as moves analysis. And I'm referring to the article Jacobson, Pawlowski, and Tardy. And looking specifically at what does genre mean to composition or writing. What is genre? I'm sure that you've all been exposed to the idea of genre in music maybe, but Jacobson et al. define genre as a category of writing. These categories are based on what the writing is trying to do. So what is the goal of the writing? Who is, who is it written for and what context is it written in? Um, for example, a condolence card, the purpose of it is to show that you have sympathy for the individual to whom you're sending the condolence card. Uh, he uses, or they use, student absence emails. Um, that's a genre, and they use that in their examples. A, student's, a student absence email lets a teacher know about an absence, so that's the purpose of it, and it may or may not also request information for how to make up a missed class. Thinking about different genres, um, I ask what genre have you been familiar with before class? Um, many of you said text messages, and some people said poetry. There were some responses about analytical writing essays. Uh, some people referred to book genres like fantasy and so on. The, in the heart of, uh, well, let me give you one example first. In Jacobson's writing, Jacobson et al., uh, they do give an example of a genre that many of us are very familiar with, which would be a review of a business. I know I use these reviews a lot if I'm traveling and I look and read them, um, what people said about a hotel I might want to stay at. I look at reviews a lot when I'm going to purchase something. You know, before I buy something, I usually, do, especially if it's something that's expensive, I have like a major research project on my hands and I'll look at reviews in multiple places and so on. So um, think about what is the goal of a review. Uh, it's to give you information very quickly. The stars that are used helps with the quickness. The date is relevant because it needs to be timely. You know, if it was a review from 10 years ago, it might not be too helpful. Jacobson et al. talk about how after someone reads a certain genre or uh, interacts with it often, you just develop expectations about what is the genre supposed to look like. It may not be something that you've articulated to yourself specifically or been really analytical about, like okay, I know this is a text message because of A, B, and C. You may not have thought about it like that, but that's what I'm asking you to do in the class. All right. If you recognize this text as a consumer restaurant review, you likely have read similar reviews before and you've started to get a sense of what they look like. This is how genre works. When we re repeatedly encounter text within a genre, we get a sense of the language and content they tend to use as well as how they arrange that language and content. So the strategies that Jacobson et al. use to analyze a genre is to break it down into parts, so to be very analytical about it. Going forward, if you're asked by a teacher or a supervisor or some other life situation to write something that is a new genre for you, the very first thing to do is to find some samples. If you can have some samples to look at, then you can know what the general expectations are in that genre. There aren't rules. These are not rules. I mean, there can be flexibility within each genre, but there usually are some basic elements of a genre which are always true every time you look at that. For example, we're going to be writing an annotated bibliography or an interview. An annotated bibliography might be a genre that you haven't written before. What are you going to need? You're going to need samples. I have some samples in D2L for that genre about how they are laid out. There are some basic things about annotated bibliographies which are always true. 
there are some elements of annotated bibliographies which are sometimes true. Well, it will be up to you to choose how you set up your annotated bibliography. Now an interview, same thing. Some elements of an interview are always true. Some elements are sometimes true. And some, element, some elements are never true. So you're going to have to decide how you want to set up your interview. And I give some suggestions in there if that's what you decide to do. Okay, so he's using, a, or they are using a genre that is very familiar, which is an email. This is a, these are generally kind of professional-ish emails. The student, the st a student's email to a teacher tends to be a little bit formal and professional. Sometimes um, teachers will get an email that is just like a text message. In that case, most of the time, um, the writer didn't realize that an email is not a text message. You know, it depends on who the recipient is, but you just cut the person some slack or whatever. And, you know, you're not going to say, oh my gosh, why did you write all in small letters and you didn't say who you were in your email or anything? It looks like a text message. You know, just like read it and see what the student's asking and then you respond to it just like you would any other email. You'll notice that something Jacobson talks about is the contact in the relationship you have with your audience. I'm writing an email to somebody and I'm really very familiar with them. Maybe I'm good friends with them. Maybe I'm good colleagues. I might write an email to them that looks like a text message. It might be all small letters, you know, and maybe there's some misspellings because I was in a hurry and I didn't feel like spell checking. Normally, I'm not going to do that unless it's somebody I know really well. Um, I tend not to write text message-ish emails to students, but I guess I could. These are the four examples that are given in the article, and what they do is they number each of the sentences so it makes it easier to look at them. Got the four samples, sample four is in the center there. And then you have uh, an analysis. So basically what the authors did was make a grid and then you look at sample one, sample two, that's what sample one, sample two, sample three, sample four. And then the moves or the elements in the writing are does the letter inform the teacher that an absence will occur? Do they apologize? Do they explain the reason? Do they request an accommodation? Do they request information about missed material? Do they take responsibility for missed work? And do they express gratitude? And you can see here that an analysis is done. And so we can say that just by looking at this, so here's the emails again. Um, I won't be in class today. Sample four says, uh, let's see, I will be absent in class from day today, sample one says. Um, I am missing class today, sample two says. Let's see, what does sample three says? Um, okay, I am still experiencing cold symptoms from the cold I caught during the start of spring break. Uh, digestive problems, I had trouble to coming, coming to class this year. Okay, did not come to class. So. All of them said that an absence occurred or will occur. We know that it seems obvious, but when you think about it, in a student absence email based on the four samples that we have, it is required that the student tell the teacher that they are going to be absent or that they were absent. That's a basic requirement of the email. There's nothing else we know is absolutely for sure. Now, it says here, three of the four emails apologized for absence. That's a majority. A majority of the emails said they were sorry. Well, the first one doesn't say they're sorry. The second one says they're sorry, right here. The third one, let's see. I would like to apologize for any inconvenience I might have caused. Well, that's a sorry. And number four, sorry, but, okay. That's where this analysis comes from. There's three of them. So then we would say that this element in, a, in the genre of student absence emails is common. The majority have this. The majority don't give a reason, only half of them do. Uh, request homework or notes or whatever, that isn't very frequent. Only one of the four samples do it. Only one of the four samples request information about missed material. Uh, half of them take responsibility for missed works. 
you know, it's common, but it's not. I mean, we only have a sample of four. We need like a sample of 50 to really be able to study the genre fully. Uh, thank the teacher. Well, the majority of the emails do that. We go back and look at these emails. So again, to know what is expected in any genre, the idea would be to look at samples. Samples of absent emails actually would be hard to get, but samples of annotated bibliographies, those are not difficult to get. Samples of text messages, not difficult to get. 